Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to the Cornerstone Church Sermons Podcast. To learn more about our ministry and how we're helping people follow Jesus, visit our website at cornerstonechurch.community. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram under the name cstone.central. We hope you enjoy today's message. When I have the opportunity to share that I am a Christian, this has become my favorite phrase to do so. It's a simple one. I give my life to Jesus. Now, I give my life to Jesus because I am absolutely convinced he is Lord of Lords and the one on the throne. I give my life to him. I give my life to Jesus also because he came and gave his life for me, to provide a way for me to experience life. And I give my life to Jesus because I am absolutely convinced that when I live in the way of Jesus, I actually experience life to the fullest. Now, as I say, I give my life to Jesus. Let me tell you what that's not. It is not, oh, back in the day, I gave my life to Jesus. Nope, it's present tense. It's also not, I added Jesus to my life. I am now Michael 2.0. Nope. I give my life to Jesus is, is all in. It's like death to life, and we'll see that here in just a bit. I give my life to Jesus is this journey of discovering more and more and more what he has in store for us. And so at Cornerstone, we're spending nine months walking through what are these relational skills that follow in the way of Jesus, whereby we attain this life to the fullest? Because some of you would say, oh, so you're, you're saying being a Christian isn't just, I prayed a prayer back in the day. It's not just, I went through that church affirmation, confirmation process? You mean it's not just that I got baptized? You're right. You're hearing what I'm saying. There is so much more. God is inviting us into something really special. And one of those relational skills that we learn is what we call connect. And you're in the right place because we're taking this journey of discovering what does it look like to connect in genuine relationship with other people. And I just want to go ahead and tell you, some of you are missing this skill. You might say, well, I have, I have my friends from back in school, or I have, well, kind of the parent friend group of our kids stuff, or I guess I have friends from work. But what you're missing is this incredible community that God says you need to be able to experience all that he has for you. You need community. This, this group of people that you're connected with, other followers of Jesus who are going the same direction, without them, you will not experience all that God has for you. Here's how we describe connect. I actively participate in a community with other believers. What's that look like? Encouragement, wise counsel, we're sharing our gifts with each other. Are you connected? Do you have that group of people? Not just back in the day, friends, not just connected through a hobby or an interest or your kid's activity. Do you have a group of people who are on the journey with you? You need them to experience all that God has for you. And we're gonna step into that just a little bit more because as we've already told you, this is the month we're building our skill to connect with others on this journey of following Jesus. Go ahead and grab your Bible. If you didn't bring one, grab one of the pocket Bibles near you. And if you grab one out of the pocket, it's page 763. Join me in Galatians 6. Galatians 6. Uh, I was chatting with Janet just a, a week or so ago. Uh, she's brand new to Cornerstone. And she said, Michael, I went all the way back to October and listened to the first four to catch up in where we're at. What an opportunity is for us to take this journey of learning all these skills, 
that position us to experience all that Jesus died to make available for you. Now, as we turn to Galatians 6, we're in for a really special treat. As we look at this passage about being connected, we jump into the story where there is division, like there is struggle. My, my, my daughter's now 12. Can't believe she's already 12. Um, she's 12, and we had one of those talks this week about friends. There were many tears shed as she grieved um, her desire for a friend, and she didn't feel like she had it. Now, what she's done well is this. Uh, she showed me her list of everything she's looking for in a friend, and it's, it's a really good list, like really good list. Um, what's lacking is her commitment to that same list. I said, Trené, if you want to have this kind of friend, you have to be that kind of friend. And she's not learned all the relational skills. This, this whole conversation is something that's fun to talk about, and it's hard to do. Like, it's this beautiful aspiration. Oh, I want rich and deep and meaningful community. But it's exhausting to have this type of relationship. And in Galatians, we see this real tension that's going on. If you're a little bit of a student of the Bible, you know that in Galatians, there's this tension between Jews and Gentiles. It was racial. And the Jews really struggled with this thought of, hey, uh, we are God's chosen people. Uh, we now believe Jesus is the Messiah and we follow him. So if you wanna follow Jesus, really the path to be a Christ follower is along the path of being a Jewish follower. I mean, he was a Jew. So if you're gonna live the way Jesus lived, you need to be a good Jew. And I gotta be fair. It was a question the church was really struggling with. Look in Acts chapter 15. As the leaders were saying, okay, we now see that the gospel has been spread to non-Jewish people. That's probably all of us. And we're thankful for that. But they couldn't figure out what do we require Gentiles to do to be good Christians. You'll see the list in Acts chapter 15. But there was this constant struggle with, oh, wait a minute. I'm Jewish and I'm still Jewish and I follow Jesus. They're followers of Jesus, but they're not Jews how do we handle this tension? And if you know Galatians, you know there is now tension between Paul and Peter. Peter's gotten sucked into this group called the Judaizers who were saying, hey, if you really wanna be Christian, you need to follow all the Jewish rules. And Paul was freaking out because what they were doing is heaping on behavioral modification, keeping rules, on top of grace, which perverts grace. And so as we jump into this passage, know that this is the story of a church divided, friendship divided, as they fight for what is hard to have, which is deep, rich, meaningful community. It's great to talk about it and want it, and then it's difficult to do the difficult work that gets us there. So week one, in this month, we talked about how in the craziness of life, it's easy to neglect community. Last week, we talked about how when we're offended or we're the offender. And this week, we step into, hey, let's just talk about the patterns of life, the routines, dare I say, the monotony of having rich, meaningful community. And then we'll have a little bit of fun while we're in the middle of talking about just these regular routines that we need to have. So here we go. There are three imperatives. Shout out to our study team for this passage because we looked at it and they discerned, hey, there are three imperatives, do this, and all of them have a why or a how. Here's, here's how you do that. So here, number one is in, conveniently, verse one. Brothers, if any is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore. You got it. Imperative number one, when you are genuinely connected, is that you go to restore. Relationships get distanced, 
broken, severed, remember, offender, offended community member. And when we are in the community, we know the responsibility to go after that person. Now, who's the community? Brothers, spiritual, two ways to describe God's people. Brothers, think the brethren, the household of faith, brothers and sisters in Christ, the family of God. Spiritual, this whole passage comes after walk in the spirit and you will yield spiritual fruit. As the family of God, those of us who are walking in the spirit are responsible to go after the one who is straight away. Anyone, any transgression, don't miss it. We are prone to say, ah, I knew she wasn't committed. Ah, I knew he was still a sinner. Ah, whoa, stop. Anyone, any transgression, go after them. Now the the how or an explanation of this imperative. The rest of verse one. In a spirit of gentleness. Okay, that's helpful. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. So when you go after that person that has strayed, be gentle. It's an aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. You're not being judgmental, you're being gentle. And let me give you a quick tip to restoring a believer who is straying. Go quick. Let me give you an example. Which is more likely to yield a restoration? Number one, hey, you seemed a little bit off last night. Are you okay? Or number two, hey, I haven't seen you for like three years. Are you okay? The first is much more likely to yield a restoration. The second one's almost like a slap in the face. Like if you haven't missed me before now, why do I even care? Go quickly. And I'll also tell you, the quicker you go, the easier it is to be gentle. Secondly, be careful. When you go to restore somebody who is caught, and the meaning of this word is not like caught red-handed by the authorities, but caught as in entangled. When you go to untangle them, be careful, lest you be tempted, maybe by their sin. Like you're going into their mess to pull them out, and while you're there, you get distracted. Or, or maybe it's that you become so focused on their sin that you let your guard down. Or maybe like last weekend, you're so aware of their sin, you're talking to other people about it. You're gossiping. Whatever the situation might be, go with gentleness, go quickly to restore, and as you do, man, keep your head up so that you will not be sucked in. So here's imperative number one. For you to have that rich, meaningful community we all want, step number one is the call to another to come back home. Come home. It's what we do. We notice quickly when somebody else is missing. It was so encouraging to sit down with JD this week and hear him talk about how the group that he and Danielle are in, like they watch out for each other. They have rich, meaningful community. Uh, Thursday night, we had our elders meeting and we are sensing a real responsibility to make sure the leaders of our group are flourishing so they can protect and call people back home. Step number one is, is that constant invitation. Hey, when is somebody a little bit off? Like, hey, last night you didn't seem yourself. Come home, come back. We missed you. And it's work. To do that, it is work. Imperative number one is to say, come home. Here's imperative number two. Conveniently, again, it's in verse two. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Here's what happens in community. When you care about other people in your life, when you love your neighbor as yourself, 
you're gonna discover that people have seasons, situations in their lives when they have a burden that is unsustainable. That's what this word means. It is heavy and one person on their own cannot sustain this weight. As a community member, I recognize that we have a responsibility to come alongside and help carry that burden that is unsustainable. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Remember when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, I'll give you the first and the biggest. Love God with all you got. And he said, but the second one is inseparable from it. Because if you love God, you will love your neighbor as yourself. And that is something that happens in a beautiful, rich, complete way in Christian community is that we look around and when there is a need, we bear it together. Just like we saw in Acts chapter two. If you have a need and we have the ability to meet it, you don't have a need because what we have is yours. Completely shared resources. That's how we see each other, okay? So how does that play out? Verse three, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. I gave you the setup for the passage. Jewish people, knowing they were chosen by God through whom he would bless all people, we're looking at these Gentiles saying, I don't know, really you need to be like us so that you can be a good Christian. Pride was getting in their way. And I'm just so thankful that we as Americans never struggle with pride or selfishness or individualism or we have it the best. I'm so glad we cannot resonate with their struggle except we can. And the temptation in life is to say, um, that's your problem. The temptation in our lives is to say, well, nobody helped me. The temptation in life is to be so busy, we don't feel the weight that has been placed on the people we say we love. Are there people in your life who are also following Jesus that you know when they walk in the room when something's off? And do you care? Or are you so busy? Are you so focused on you that you are missing opportunities to connect? and collectively to bear one another's burdens. When we have real community, we're never on our own. It's never about what we can carry on our own because we have the people around us who love us that jump in. And we have this incredible joy of recognizing when somebody else hits one of those seasons or situations, we jump in together and carry that burden and together it's sustainable. Bear one another's burdens. Be careful. Be careful that you don't let yourself get so busy or selfish that you miss a person in your community who has need. Bear one another's burdens. And in one of the most beautiful ways, you follow Jesus when you do that. Which brings us to the third, which is now in verse four. Let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not to his neighbor. Now, here's where we get some really important clarification about these burdens or loads that we carry. A burden is an unsustainable weight. A load is a rightly sized weight. Think backpack. Think normal course of life. This is what you were made to do, to steward. It's a gift God has given you. It's, it's an ability. It's a responsibility in life. It's following Jesus, yourself, 
and in your home and with your friends. Like you have responsibility in this thing called life. One of the things that Christians mess up is their view of standing before Jesus. Many Christians have in mind this horrifying thought that Jesus is gonna bring back up the sin that they committed way back in the day. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, if you have given your life to Jesus, your sins are atoned for. They are forgiven. They are done. As far as the east is from the west, you are forgiven and have the righteousness of Christ. When you stand before Jesus one day, what you will be answering for is what you did with your salvation. You, made in the image of God, Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, what'd you do with your life? That's what we stand before him one day. Now for our sins, he paid that price. What is your load, your gift, that you answer to God? You alone, not your neighbor. And I've got to tell you, this has been a struggle all my life to just think about me, to just think about living my life as God has given me to live before him. Because first of all, I struggled for many, many years, yes, I'll be straight, decades as a people pleaser. I cared far more what I thought you thought about me than what God thought about me. And then secondly, I'm just super competitive. As long as I can beat you to the finish line, as long as I don't screw up as bad as you did, or somehow rationalize that in my mind that I'm doing pretty good, I forget that I don't answer for you. Like what you are gifted to do has absolutely no grounds in what I am doing for God. Carry your load for God. He's given you gifts, abilities, resources, talents, all of this stuff. You live the life God has given you, which is your responsibility, your load. Verse five, for each will have to bear his own load. You have that responsibility before God. Some of us have been falling into this trap of wanting other people to carry what's rightly ours. And some of us have been falling into the trap of carrying that which you cannot sustain. Some of you have abdicated, like, hey, carry this for me. Some of you have refused to ask for help. Which are you? Which is your greater, greater struggle? So to have a little fun with this, um, Pastor Jason has, has secured some volunteers and we're gonna, we're gonna talk this through. Like, what does this look like in real life to have a burden that should be shared, to have a load that should be carried? And how do I know when things are just off? And a huge shout out to Jason. We had a lot of fun playing with this and this is mostly Jason's story. All right, so please meet Sam, Aaron, and Jim. In real life, we have a son, his wife, and his dad. But for our story today, what we have, let's see, Jim, Sam, would you guys switch places for me? And I'll go ahead and switch your cups. Here we go. All right, Aaron, uh, this is your story. You are a single mother of three, and you work full time. So I want you to go ahead and, let's see, should we do these right? This is a normal sized load. Uh, But you're in a season of life where there is a lot going on. You following Jesus, your kids following Jesus, got the job. Um, You have a lot that's happening in your life. And so you, you have the normal load but also you have a little extra in this season. So I want you to take this third cup. All right, very good, very good. Okay, now, now Jim, here's your situation. Um, you have a job, you have a family, 
You have a spouse who partners really well uh, with you in that. So your, your load is, is full, um, but it's more right-sized, like it's more normal. So if you would, go ahead and take your cups. Now, this is going to be hard to imagine, but this guy represents someone in your life who um, is a little bit irresponsible. I mean, I know you can't imagine that Sam would ever be that guy. So this is a fictitious member of your life. Actually, this, this guy could be your son. He could be a, a coworker. Uh, it could be somebody who has his own load but he's not packing all of it. So go ahead and grab your two cups, all right? And what I want you to do, Sam, is go ahead and show us what it looks like for a guy to not carry the full load of his life, like job, responsibility. Maybe you're in dad's basement playing video games. Maybe you're at work letting him carry the full package of the responsibility. So go ahead and sit down your cup. Ah, no, you're gonna keep one. You got... At least you get up in the morning and take a shower and eat something. All right, so you do part of that. All right, so here's where life gets complicated. Ah, keep your cup. Come on, Sam, don't put it down. Don't put it down. Okay, you got it, got it. Don't touch the table. Did we not tell you the rules? Okay. All right, so here's where life just got complicated because Aaron's mom just ended up in the hospital. Okay. Jim, you're in community with her. And so you have the opportunity, if you would please, to go ahead and pitch in because her, her life is already full, but now it's unsustainable. She cannot carry cup number four. Let's see if she can. Go ahead and put the red one down. Let's, let's see. What do you think? Can you, can you pick that sucker up? Has to be on the side. Can't like hook it with your finger or anything like that? No. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Point proven. But... You have this lazy thug in your life. (laughs) And so now you have a choice. Whose cup you're going to carry? Because you, just like Aaron, cannot pick up all four. So who do you choose? Oh, yeah, you're going to tell me. What do you want me to do? The sad reality is that there are people in your life and in our lives who are making us choose because they're not carrying their load. But if Sam takes his cup, then Jim can take Aaron's cup. And in the most beautiful way, hey, next week, you could set the red one down and Sam could step in and take the third cup because that's what community does. But if any of us, whether it's Sam or Jim, Um, we cannot help Aaron in her time of need if we have abdicated that special responsibility that God has given us. All right, you guys may set them down. Let's Let's give them a hand. Thank them for jumping up. You know, it's it's one thing to talk theoretically about, okay, okay, am I, am I carrying my load that God has given me? Am I bearing burdens? And an illustration like that just, just makes it a little more understandable, practical. Where is the place that you have let it slide? Here are the three. The first one is come back home. Is there somebody in your community that you missed the opportunity to say, hey, things felt off last night. You okay? And if it doesn't change three years from now, you'll be saying, hey, haven't seen you for years. You okay? Doesn't work very well then. Or how about number two? Have you been saying, hey, we got you. We got you. Um, Even to the place where you're asking people to let you help because you know if they continue to do this themselves, they will drown. We got you. Or how about we have ours? Have you been operating in this relational skill of connect by recognizing I need 
to carry what God has given me and quit asking other people to carry it. Not just the sit in the basement and play video games while you expect your parents to pay the bills, but in all aspects of life. All the aspects of community, the time and the commitment, the conversation, the gifts that God has given you to be shared for the greater good. Do you know what they are? God's word promises that if you have given your life to Jesus, you are gifted. You, are, you have a calling, you have a ministry, you have a purpose. If you don't know what that is, your first responsibility is to go find it. Begin to ask the people in your life, what, what have you seen in me? Begin to listen for the things that people say to you. You are so good at that. And you've thought, that is no big deal at all. But it is a big deal because that's how God has gifted you. We each have our, our own. Which of those three is your greatest challenge? To pursue? To allow others to help you? or to take your responsibility. Look at how this section ends in this conversation about community. Verse nine and 10. And let us not grow weary of doing good. I said at the beginning, let me say it again. Being connected with other believers on this journey of following Jesus is an inspiring aspiration and it's hard work which is why Paul says, don't, don't, don't quit. Don't get weary for in due season, we will reap if we don't give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those of the household of faith. We talked about that in the first two weeks. It starts with us and then overflows to everyone. It starts with how we care for one another and others see it and they're like, wow, you guys have something really special. You guys must all like the same thing. Well, not really. You guys must all be the same. You're like each other. No, not really. It's that we have all given our lives to Jesus. We're on the same journey. Have lots of differences, many different things that we like but together we live for Jesus and love one another. Notice all the plural pronouns in those two verses. Let us, we, 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 all the way home, had to say that. <laughs> Everyone, those, look at all those plural pronouns. Do, do, you, do you sense that responsibility? And do you have that blessing? Do you, do you have that relational skill of connectedness? You need it. I need it. We need each other to be able to experience what Jesus made possible. And, and, and think about how Jesus set us up for this. The son of God left heaven, took on flesh so that he could, number one, restore us. He pursues us. To go after somebody who has strayed is to follow in the way of Jesus. He left heaven for you. To bear your burden, a weight you could not carry that propelled him to go to the cross. And he willingly stretched out his arm and took a burden that you could not carry, willingly dying in your place, inviting you, inviting you to have life, to have that forgiveness and restored relationship with God that positions you for ministry and to finish well, to give your life to Jesus. That's what this is all about. We can't do it alone, but together we give our lives to the one who willingly stretched out his arms and died in our place. All of this is a response to what Christ has done for us. Let me pray for us today. 
Father, what a joy it is to be students of your word today and and to see again the beauty of the cross that invites us into relationship with you, that invites us into a really special relationship with others who have given their lives to you. God, I am so thankful for those who are studying and listening with me as we hear your word today. Holy Spirit, I pray and ask that you would take the truth that has been presented from your word and bring us into that place of discovering what does it look like for us to respond to your truth? God, thank you that you've provided the way of our salvation. Thank you that you've provided our community to live out our salvation in following you all the days of our lives. And what an incredible promise that you've made us that we will dwell in your house forever. God, help us to see the finish line today in seasons when we wanna give up, in seasons when we're disgusted with other people who used to be with us and compel us again to go run after them much like you pursued us. To your glory, I ask that you would stir us in this way We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.